Um, so welcome back everybody after lunch. Uh, hope you've all had a bite to eat um, or followed the lightning sessions that we were just on before. Um, so I'm Torsten, one of the organizers uh, together with Nayana and uh, we're going to run the session for the next, what is it, almost 50 minutes um, and I'll introduce our speaker just now. Just a few remarks, um, we'll have some people coming in and out, we'll try and make it reduce the number of interruptions. Um, but if you could tweet about the session and you do make in, have access, so you tweet regularly, just annotate as at FOSS Asia, just so we get some publicity. And I think we've been trending the last few days, which is which is great for this event. Um, okay, so this session that's going to kick off now is <clears throat> Shenzhen, a case study alternative to Western style innovation. Um, I won't read too much about the kind of topic uh, overview. Um, Banny will take you through that. Um, Benny will also have to explain what happened to his leg yesterday. Um, so Benny's been, uh, Benny's been around the, the, the conference uh, for many years now um, and participating in, in FOSS Asia. Uh, really background, in, well, kind of known for his hacking the Microsoft Xbox and kind of part of the uh, open source hardware community. Um, really through his innovation of Novena, which was a DIY laptop. Um, Bunny also received his PhD in electrical engineering from MIT uh, already 2002 and so he lives in Singapore and runs a private product design studio Kosagi and so he's actively involved in a number of startups and um, student initiatives with the MIT uh, Media Lab. So Bunny I think you're all mic'd up. Yep. Okay and over to him. Thanks. All the best. Hello. Testing. Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I probably can guarantee you I'm the only speaker on drugs at this conference. They gave me some really good opioid painkillers and uh, the coffees to help counter the side effects of it, which make me a little bit dizzy and, and drowsy. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk a bit about um, uh, Shenzhen as an alternative to the American way of innovation. I say the American way because there's a sort of sort of notion that um, you know, there's a lot of innovation that comes out of America, and because of the existence of that, of the of the sort of the result, the process must be um, the process. Um, and I think there are other alternative processes that and I hope to sort of introduce you to some through the lens of of, um, of Shenzhen in particular. Um, so, start, basically, start with a case study of sort of um, how Shenzhen came about. Right, it started as a fishing village about 30 years ago, and now it's a tech powerhouse, and the question is, how did that come about? Um, how many people here have actually been to Shenzhen? I'm curious. Okay, so, about half. Okay. So, the next few slides, I'm, I'm going to try and um, sort of go and look at Shenzhen um, through several different lenses. Um, one is Shenzhen as a place, so we'll talk about, like, what you might see there if you haven't been there yet. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about Shenzhen over time, like the time evolution of Shenzhen and the history of it. Um, and then I'm going to look, put a couple of lenses on. Uh, one is uh, the flow of capital um, within Shenzhen and the ecosystem, and then the flow of IP, which becomes a segue into a broader discussion about IP practices and how um, emergent innovation may happen in the internet age. So um, for people who haven't been to Shenzhen, um, I'm going to do a little exercise that I call zooming in on the place. This is like if you've seen those videos of like the powers of 10 where they start at the galaxy and they go to like planets and they go to like Earth and then hands and stuff. It's a bit like that, but you know, starting at the, um, at the sort of the territory level uh, of Shenzhen. So um, when I talk about Shenzhen, and a lot of people when they say Shenzhen, they're actually referring to the Pearl River Delta, right? It's not, Shenzhen itself is a specific city in an area. Um, it's like when people say Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is what? It's like San Jose or San Francisco, is it Fremont, is it like, it's this, it's this huge area. And so uh, Shenzhen has sort of been used as a generic term for the overall Pearl River Delta. Um, and in 1980, it had a population of about 300,000 people. Uh, and in 2011, it's had 10 million people. Um, currently seems to be uh, what, about 40 million people and half a trillion dollars GDP in 2007. That's, that's a decade old, those numbers. So it's like, um, you know, it's a big area. It's very productive. Um, it typically includes, when I say Shenzhen, people will mean if they land in Hong Kong, they say they're going to Shenzhen. If they land in Guangzhou, they say they're in Shenzhen. If they go to Dongguan, they're in Shenzhen. So, so what th that's a little clarification of the overall area. So at 1xZoom, these are the stereotypes that basically everyone knows 
Um, there's a company called Foxconn there. It has millions of employees and hundreds of billions of dollar revenue. Uh, produces hundreds of millions of products per month. They make iPhones in Shenzhen, and there's a communism in China, right? These are sort of like the things that everyone knows about it. Um, and then you look at sort of the stuff that comes out of it, and both of these devices are made in Shenzhen. So the one on the right, you're probably familiar with, that's an iPhone. The one on the left looks like an iPhone, except it's much smaller, and it runs Android, and it costs about 40 bucks. Um, and both of these things are coming out of that same ecosystem, right? And, th and this, this sort of becomes like a little thread you can start pulling. Like, how does this come about? Where, is it, where does it happen? I mean, it's a, you know, it's a very easy to sort of state the platitude of, oh, they just copied a bunch of IP and they put it into this box. Except that, like, this is not really a direct copy of IP. You don't just copy something and print it and then just, what, turn the resolution smaller and you get a smaller phone. It's actually, you know, fundamentally a different piece of thing that just has to look the same on the outside. Um, and it's more than just iPhones and clones. Um, so these are just like some examples of, of the types of things you might see there. Um, and that top picture, everything in that, in that case will make a call. So all those little model cars there have phones on the inside of them. Um, this looks like an Apple Watch, and this is from uh, a long, long time ago. And the guy who was showing this off to me was like, unlike the Apple Watch, this watch actually has a full GSM phone and can make a call. It doesn't have to be tethered to your phone to make a call. It actually has the phone in the watch. And a lot of the people in Shenzhen were like, why didn't Apple put a phone in the watch? This is like, you know, they're so behind the times, um, even, you know, when, the, when it first launched. And then and they have like just weird stuff like, oh, I wanted some Marlboro branded phones. So they just built it. Um, so then if you zoom in a bit on the actual area where most of the electronics trading happens, so the electronics market area, there's a district. This is a picture from about uh, maybe five or ten years ago. And every building you see there is related to the trade of electronics. This is not a financial district. This is not an oil district. It's not a residential district. All of those things are sort of um, top to bottom uh, devoted to, to the trade of electronics. It's about a square mile um, in size. Um, if you were to walk inside one of those buildings and take a look, this is what a typical view might look like. Um, it's a little bit like if you imagine a wet market. So if you went to the hawker centers in Singapore or you went to like the wet markets, Instead of them selling like Teochew noodles or like, you know, you know, you know Hainan chicken whatever, rice or whatever it is, they'll specialize in resistors or they'll specialize in diodes or capacitors or like whatever it is. They all have little stalls that specialize in their own little thing. Um, and if you were to, and, and then if you're, and there's probably like, you know, hundreds of these shops inside each one of those buildings. So you already get the idea of like the, the immense amount of diversity and the immense amount of, um, traffic that has. If you were then to go into one of the shops and take a look on the inside, um, you would, you can um, take a look at the amount of inventory they have. So uh, if people aren't familiar, on the, on, the, on the image on the left, they have those round things. Those are called tape and reels. Each one of those has about 10,000 capacitors on them. Okay. And this shop, ha each of those boxes has about five to 10 of those tape and reel on the inside. So this shop has literally millions of capacitors and, re and, and resistors on the inside of it. And so this is a place where you can just walk in with cash and be like, hi, I have a production run of 100,000 units a day. Um, I need to buy my inventory for it. And you just give them cash over the counter. You walk out with the inventory to do that sort of production. So it's not like a thing I have to go to DigiKey or I have to negotiate with the manufacturer or I have to place POs for long lead time. You just walk in and you just get the parts and go to production, like mass scale production. And um, Another interesting bit about it is that like um, a lot of these shops, if you were to look at the, the chip inventory on the inside, I was like walking around and just sort of counting the number of chips. And you went to go to like, for example, DigiKey or Element 14, they'll have more inventory in the shelves of those shops than all of North America um, in, in these little shops for certain chips, right? And so it's, it's pretty remarkable the amount of, of stuff they have. And it turns out that like um, a lot of these shops are really just sort of family run businesses. Like these are people who, um, came from, a lot of them came from one particular part of, of China. They all speak the same dialect. Um, and instead of, uh, you know, being a fisherman or trading in ducks or live animals, they just became experts in trading um, resistors. And it, they weren't, they don't have degrees in electronics. They don't have, like, um, actual knowledge of how to use it, but they're extremely good at trading it. They know where to buy them from. They know how to sell it. They know how to negotiate the price. These people, 
you see these people that have like maybe a thousand products available and you can just be like, uh, you know, I want this one, how much for a thousand? They'll just write out the price. They don't look it up in a book. This is all day long, all they do is they trade these components. They're very good at it. Um, and then, you know, at the end of the day, you can just bulk it up and hire a guy to, to push it around for you in the market and go to your factory and start production. Um, one of the other interesting things is that when you go outside the market, I call this the million X zoom, you go into the streets, you'll see things like this going on. And it's easy to sort of like not even look at them because you're so overwhelmed by the, by the pretty lights and like flashing things and whatever it is. But you'll notice like, you'll notice guys sitting with these little signs in a big pile of like junk in front of them. Or you'll see people like crowded around mobile phones laying on the sidewalk. Or you'll see a, a scene like this where this is, um, Right next to it, you can see there's the little pink stalls. It's a, that's kind of a hawker stall kind of thing. And right next to it is like just spilling over a cornucopia of like mobile phone cases. And people are walking up there and like taking parts out of the mobile phone cases, doing this sort of thing. So you, you, you see this happening a lot um, in the district. It's, it's a, it, because the district has become a little more gentrified, you don't see it quite as much today. But um, this, is, this is really uh, an interesting phenomenon. And what they're doing is they're basically um, doing a lot of recycling of the parts. And if you think about why these people are so excited to do this, um, you just think a little bit about the, 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 the economic incentive. So the value of one of these parts is new might be 10 bucks, but if you can pull it off of a board and refurbish it and make it look like new, you can, it's a perfectly good part. Silicon doesn't really go bad. You can sell it for $5. And, and the other thing is a lot of times if you go into the market, you can actually, they'll actually tell you no, these are used ones. These are these are these are new ones, and they'll they don't they don't they're not dodgy about at that level. If they're used or new, it's usually when you get the fake parts in your supply chain, it's someone who bought it from them and then is blending it into their supply chain and selling it's new. The, the recyclers are pretty much upfront about what what they're what they're pulling out or not. Um, their cost of goods is virtually zero. Okay. And um, the minimum wage, this is a little bit out of date, but like about a about 1,000 RMB per month in a factory, maybe now about 2,000 because of inflation, but still only about three or 400 bucks per month. But the value of the parts in that little dish there alone is like a couple thousand bucks, right? So it's like 12 and a half X over minimum wage if it took them a month to pull those out of the parts. And so if you were to compute the wage parity of what you would get, like you know, your cost of living, assuming that your um, minimum wage of $8, it'd be the equivalent of having like a $200,000 a year job basically pulling junk out and, and, and upcycling it. Um, and there, one of the really important things to note is that the skill used to do the recycling is actually a skill that's trained at factories. So like um, I was at a factory once that was doing video cards, a bunch of NVIDIA video cards, and there was a person there who was, had a pile of cards and she was pulling off DDR memory pulling the balls off, putting new balls on, and preparing them for production again, because those were defective cards, right? And they're not just going to throw them away. They're going to recover all the memory, and they're going to reuse it in production. So this girl was being paid probably minimum wage to recycle parts at enormous value to the company. And what happens is these people are like, wait, why am I being paid minimum wage to do this? Why don't I acquire those parts myself and then go into business selling parts like new, because this is what they do in the companies all the time. So that's why you see a lot of recycling happening in the ecosystem. And uh, to put a little bit more of a fine point on what the gray market and fakes are, a lot of people, when they think of faking, they think of the thing on the left, right? It's like, you know, oh, we're going to make a fake iPhone. The thing is, it's, it's super hard to do that, and it's really trivial to tell it's a fake, right? It's like, it's actually the wrong equation. You put all this effort in, and a lot of people are like, I'm not going to pay as much as a real iPhone for this because it's a smaller, crappier iPhone, right? They expect it to be really cheap. Actually, the more common type of fake is what happens on the right-hand side. This is an example of a part that I actually had bought. It's a, it's a genuine Xilinx Spartan 6, um, but if you look at the, the chip, you see a little white rectangle um, that I kind of highlighted in the arrow there. What happened was that the vendor had uh, taken the laser cutter and sort of um, uh, uh, blasted off uh, a, a label on that said ES, engineering sample, right? And so they were, they're perfectly valid silicon from Xilinx, right? They, in fact, the, the engineering samples for this particular chip had only one small radon versus the main product. But when Xilinx retired the engineering samples, the distributors were all supposed to grind them up and throw them away because you're not allowed to sell them into the market. Instead, what they did is, is, is uh, this, this, this particular uh, problem, they actually were very clever about it. They went, they laser marked off the ES. So you know, when, when, they, when someone checks, particularly the untrained people, they say, okay, we have to make sure all the numbers are there, there's nothing extra. 
And then this white rectangle, like, okay, whatever, right? You know, there's just a white rectangle on it, right? And then, so it gets into the factory, and they only blended it in at a rate of about 3% into the supply chain, right? So if you had any problems, you might think that it was just a problem with your design or some defectivity or whatever it is. But the average part vendor, when they're in the supply chain, only makes a few percent margin. So by blending at 3%, they double their take, essentially, out of the deal on a very, very expensive part, and it's very hard to detect. This is very easy to do, but very hard to detect. This is the, actually the much more typical type of faking that you have in the market. So um, the most notorious fakes are usually derivatives of, of genuine goods. So it's not like someone's actually gone and copied the good, but they're actually, for example, a ghost shift. So this is when you have a factory line that produces um, a particular product. It's fully approved. All the workers are trained. They have all the test procedures. And what they do is they run a force shift in the middle of the night when the managers are out and they keep the product themselves and they, all the margin they sell directly at the market. That's a ghost shift. Right? Those are very, very hard to detect because they, they're actually, for all intents and purposes, genuine. It's just that they may not care as much to throw away the rejects. Right? They'll blend them into the, into the, into the, into the production. Uh, refurbishing, like I talked about, uh, remarking of parts. Uh, warranty fraud is a very typical thing. Um, so this is where people will say, okay, um, you've got a phone um, that's got a problem. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, do something to it so I can hand it back to Apple and get a brand new phone, right? And so essentially they can take a phone that someone would throw away, hack it a little bit, and it'll trigger a code from Apple that causes an automatic, like there's these codes they put on the screen and you go in the Genius Bar and plug it in, like, oh, this is ID code, blah. okay, well, you get a new phone, right? And so essentially it's a, it's a form of fraud that they do to try and um, upcycle phones that would otherwise be thrown away. Um, and then also um, improperly destroyed production defects. So if anyone who does hardware knows that you don't get 100% yield. Uh, stuff that doesn't work, you're supposed to destroy and throw away. They don't get destroyed and thrown away. Instead, they're remarked, labeled, and sold on the market. So that's more typically the types of fakes that you see. Um, so that's sort of Shenzhen as a place. Um, I'm going to talk about Shenzhen uh, over time, right? So the, the snapshot you saw was probably accurate as of about like two or three years ago. Um, the place is very dynamic, constantly changing. Um, but, uh, you know, in the 1980s, uh, China had a billion people and they didn't have a Shenzhen, right? Uh, and what happened was around then, s some very large manufacturers, the Foxconn and the Huawei, started setting up huge mega factories there because of cheaper labor and had almost no infrastructure. They just brought in um, sort of assembly laborers to sort of, you know, build PC motherboards back in the day was the big thing, right? You know, just hand stuffing components, whatever it is, toys, whatever. Um, and so out of a billion people, they take, maybe took a percent of them and they got 10 million assembly laborers um, trained up to do um, factory assembly. Um, and then in the 90s, they had sort of like a diaspora of medium to small factories. What happens when you have one large factory is you have other small factories that crop up around it to service a large factory. So a Foxconn facility might be assembling a PC case but then you need someone who supplies the metal for the case. You need someone who supplies the cables. You need someone who supplies um, test equipment, someone who services the assembly robots. And those all become small factories um, near that area because it's more efficient, more competitive. And so you have a diaspora of a small to medium-sized factories um, filled with hundreds of thousands of te technicians and engineers. These are people who, over the last decade, had maybe been assembling stuff and figured out how to uh, repair things or figure out what's going wrong. They've learned a little bit on the job. Um, and that led to, around the, the turn of the millennium, uh, the rise of the Shanzai. The Shanzai are the people who are known as sort of the copycat barons of China. Um, and essentially, the, 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 perhaps you know, the anecdote that I've heard about where they come is they're a bunch of people who are like tax engineers in companies like Motorola and Nokia, uh, Blackberry Rim, that sort of thing. And they were just like, we could build this so much cheaper if you guys didn't have all this stupid process. Right? They would have all these meetings and like reviews and throw away things and like they're like like guys like we can build this phone for half the price if we just did it this way, and they would get pissed off and they would leave with all the IP and they'd be like we're just going to build phones at half the price because we know how to do this right and so they would go out and they would build phones at half the price and sell them and they would you know change one letter in the name from Nokia to a Nikia or whatever it is and then uh, you had these sort of phones arising and they were they were pretty much direct copies back at the time. Um, but out, out of those, you know, sort of shanza, you end up getting thousands of sort of managers and designers of shops that were, now have routinely produced a difficult consumer product, and they know a lot about it, and they're, they're, they're pondering, okay, well, 
we have all this capability, we, we need to differentiate ourselves. We had to do something different. Now, now they really are at a position where they can be like, okay, what innovation should we do? Um, and out of those, from the, from the Shanzai, around 2010, we start to see the rise of companies like Xiaomi and Tencent, Taobao, Alibaba, these sorts of things. Um, they sort of emerge out of this as the people, the, the group of people who are able to actually come up with an idea, innovate, create something different, and now you have your sort of dozens of major tech corps in China um, sort of um, rising up out of it. But the, the really interesting thing is that, like, at the point at which the innovation happened, it wasn't sort of top-down. Someone didn't walk in and say, we're going to build, like, a huge factory and do it. The point at which someone wanted to innovate, they had the whole supply chain behind them to, to do it. They could execute very quickly and very rapidly. And so a lot, you know, one question I oftentimes get from, like, U.S. pundits is, like, you know, how can we, how do we bring this to, you know, to Silicon Valley? Why is, why aren't we doing this in Silicon Valley? Like, how much money would it take? What would have to do? Surely you just have to take a few key players, transplant them and give them some money and things will happen, right? And I'm just like, you don't understand, like you need to have like hands that know how to do these things to build these products. They're not just, you know, it's not like GitHub where you just clone and, and make, right? Um, so it, another len lens to look at Shenzhen through is the flow of capital. Um, and this, this is another piece of the puzzle that sort of explains the phenomenon. Um, Decades ago, someone invested million dollars in a pick and place line, right? And this pick and place line probably built um, your BlackBerry phone, right? Or your whatever, your little Motorola flip phone back in the day. And they were doing 0402 components and it cost millions of dollars. The, that machine ran for three years and the company decided they had to upgrade so they, they got rid of the equipment. But they don't throw it away. They sell it at 10% of the price, $100,000 as scrap, right? Another factory picks it up and says, okay, I'm going to use these and I'm going to build, I don't know, DVD players using this old mo mo uh, mobile phone line. They'll use that for 10 years. Robots don't go bad, right? You know, they, they have essentially an infinite lifetime as long as you replace the parts that wear out. That guy says, okay, I'm done with this business. I'm going to sell this line for $10,000, right? And it gets picked up by some random ass factory building weird things, right? Um, you wouldn't think that they would need to have a, a robot that can do BGA and 042 and all this sort of stuff. But for $10,000, someone's getting that million dollar line that was producing these phones, um, you know, a couple decades ago. And so what ends up happening is you have a huge amount of excess capacity um, that reflects the innovation and investment in the ecosystem for very cheap at the, at the very bottom of the pyramid. And so this is, this is a picture that I saw, uh, I snapped, of a, that's a pick and place line on the back of a truck. And you can see how very carefully they've packed it for transportation because obviously it was a very expensive purchase um, and they really cared to get it there in one piece. But I mean, you know, all, all that being said, when it got to the other side, they had technicians who knew how to like tweak and tune it. That, was, that wasn't going to be an issue. They're like, you know, save the money in the box, we'll just calibrate it when it comes, right? That's kind of the level um, that they are at that ecosystem. So if you look at sort of then also the flow of parts, um, another l uh, lens on, on the flow of capital, when you have a build of a million plus units, right? Um, there's two paths that the builds can go. One is to users, uh, which is the lower path, and then the users eventually throw it away. Um, it becomes e-waste, there's zero cogs to it, goes in recycling, and as I told you about it, you know, you can resell it for 50% of the original price on, on the gray market. The other direction it can go is that, like, if you have a million plus unit build, you have what I call the hot dog and buns problem, except on a massive barbecue scale, right? If you have a barbecue, you have buns, pack of 10, hot dogs, pack of 8. And so at the end of the day, you're going to have two buns left over. Um, when you do a million unit build, you're going to have some hot dogs and buns left over, um, except that at that scale, it's like 10,000 is your, is your tailings after the, after the, after the run. Uh, and of course, the factory doesn't just throw them away, right? The factory will scrap and liquidate them for about 10% of the original purchase price. And um, one of the other key things to keep in mind is that factories often have an aging schedule. They can't actually keep parts on the line for longer than two years because, the, you, know, the, you know, oxidation, whatever problems. So they have mandatory trash deadlines for the, for the inventory if it doesn't get used up in time. So there's this constant flow, like trickle-down flow of scrap and excess that's coming into that gray market. People will aggregate, uh, repackage, and test that scrap and sell it on the gray market. So this is another uh, source of the components of gray market. So when people say, hey, you know, you go into the gray market and can you trust the components? Well, you really have to know where it's coming from, right? Is it coming from, if it came from a factory excess and there's a bunch of resistors, it's going to be fine, right? Just take it, right? It's not a big problem. If it's like recycled memory chips, okay, 
you might want to be a little, a little bit careful because flash memory does wear out over time. Um, so those are the sort of the, the four, the, the four uh, three lenses I showed in Shenzhen um, just now. Uh, but now there's a question of sort of IP. Uh, how, now that we know that they can get parts and where the parts come from, how do they go from like a tray of like parts into an actual phone? It doesn't just happen overnight. It has to be some IP added. So um, uh, I went through and I tried to sort of trace the flow of IP um, as it happens in the ecosystem. And this is an example of um, like a drawing I managed to pull off the internet inside China of like one of the older phones being built. And um, sort of the punchline is I, I call it, there's a system I call Gongkai. It's not, it's not actually the word for open source. There's actually a proper Chinese word for open source. But as everyone here knows, open source implies a certain license, right? You have the right to license it under a BSD license, or you have the right to license it on a GPL license. In Gongkai, you don't have the right to license it. You have it, right? It's the different, and so the Gongkai sort of means public. It's the difference between being like, hey, uh, I'm going to do a porn shoot and like put my picture out on the internet because I want to, or I happen to be like showering in front of my window and someone took a picture of me and they put pictures of it on the internet. They're both on the internet, right? But one of them was intentional, the other one was not. Um, and so, uh, you know, the Gongkai system sort of evolved in the absence of Western influence, largely insulated. Um, it has a similar impact from the standpoint of enabling access, but a very different cultural legal uh, construct, and it enabled a rhythmic burn of hardware that we see. Um, but the question is, is how, right? How does this come about? And the reason why it's a conundrum is if you um, review the Western uh, IP theory, there's a, there's, a, there's a social bargain that's struck um, between innovators and the public, right? Um, if you were to read the U.S. Constitution, it actually says that Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to the respective writings and discoveries, right? And so the idea was that you wanted to re re reward risk-taking behavior with an exclusive right to any inventions you may come up with, right? So this, this is the, the social bargain because you know, obviously you want to disseminate the information so other people can innovate, but you also want to make sure the person has some time to go ahead and monetize it. There's some problems with the bargain today is that limited times uh, is now 20 years for a patent. Um, 20 years in the tech industry is an eternity. That was like from the 8088 to the Pentium 3, so we went from a 5 megahertz machine to 800 megahertz machine. Might as well be forever, right? Maybe it's in perpetuity. And copyrights are in fact an eternity. Uh, anything that you saw when you were a child growing up, you will never be able to uh, rip, mix, and burn and use on your own. You can't own your childhood anymore. It is owned by Disney and other people who will sell your childhood back to you again in the form of sequels. Um, so um, the interesting thing about op open source is the open source bargain recognizes that money wealth is not the sole driver of innovation. So this one strikes a slightly different bargain. One is that, um, you know, uh, maybe I want public recognition, I want attribution. Uh, maybe I want to have a legacy, you know. Maybe I'm just curious, maybe I have some altruism, right? And so uh, what they did is they said, okay, instead of saying, like, I'm going to have a limited amount of time to sort of milk the public for this, you're going to promise not to sue me, uh, and you're going to go ahead and attribute me, and then you're going to share my idea with the rest of the crowd, right? So that's what a lot of the basic licenses um, look like. The problem is, is that Western style openness still bears a heavy legal burden. And my, the, the example I like to cite of this is that the two open source initiatives, open source initiative and open source hardware initiative, had a lawsuit over their logo because they look too similar, right? And the reason why they have this lawsuit isn't because they're a bunch of pricks, it's because there's actually like a legal theory that if you don't try to enforce your rights, then you lose your rights, right? You know, there's actually sort of a, uh, an encouragement in the law to try and actively pursue, particularly around trademarks, these type, types of things. And so, like, you know, who in this room has money and time to just go ahead and, like, you know, go into courts and, like, fight over stuff like this? Unless you're a lawyer, in which, you know, both of these institutions had, like, lawyers on their board, so it was not a problem for them to do that. And, uh, and there's a whole bunch of other stuff, just like, you know, you just, you, you have to really comply with the licenses. There's, there's a whole, like, is my GPL clean? Um, there's a whole bunch of like, um, like you know, if you, if you license something GPL, it'll never end up in a Microsoft repo, for example. But if you do BSD, Microsoft might pick it up and use it, right? There's a whole bunch of um, overhead that goes with it. 
So what's the impact of that legal burden? Okay, so this is a, you know, perhaps, you know, slightly skewed uh, example, but like, uh, I like to say this is an example of what Gonkai can produce on the left and what open source produces on the right. And so these two are like a snapshot from around the same time. Uh, on the right hand side was, is the Arduino Uno. A lot of people are familiar with it. It's a typical piece of open hardware as practiced by uh, typical hackers at the time. It's a 16-bit, 8-bit, uh, uh, 16 megahertz CPU with 2.5K of RAM, has a serial interface and a voltage regulator, costs about 29 bucks, quantity one, right? Around the same time, if you went into the uh, markets and you look at what the Shanzai were producing, they were building quad-band GSM boards, uh, foam boards with a 260 megahertz CPU, Bluetooth, OLED display, MP3 prayer, lithium poly battery, $12, quantity one, right? So, the, so with these people on the left-hand side had no burden at all to acquire the IP to build that phone, right? And so they were able to go ahead and build that phone. Whereas on the right-hand side, uh, the people who built the Arduino Uno had no burden to acquire the IP to build the Arduino Uno, but that's about as far as you can get. You, you, you're good luck trying to get the IP to build a phone in the Western ecosystem. You try to write through the front door. They'll, they'll, li they'll literally be like, you have to pay us a quarter million dollars to even see the data sheet um, for a lot of these phones. So um, based upon this, the question is, how does Gonkai survive? According to Western IP theory, the basic bargain is broken. There's no motivation to take a risk. You take a risk, and it's going to get stolen from you, right? That's, you know, but the evidence is that business is booming. You, know, you have Xiaomi, you have MediaTek, you have all this sort of stuff. They're, they're coming up. Like, so clearly, like either, you know, either they're broken or the idea of the bargain is broken, right? And the evidence seems to show the, the, the opposite. So the, the explanation I have for this is that China, this is a picture of the Galapagos. China is like a Galapagos. Like the, it's an insulated ecosystem that was able to create its own sort of norms and rules uh, in a stable fashion that is sustainable. Um, and so if you were to look at sort of the changing face of innovation internet age, um, on the left hand side is a picture that I, I pulled out from whatever the internet of, of what is a classic view of innovation. This is like, the, I think it's called the alchemist stone or something like this. And it's, you know, literally a gray bearded white guy, right? Um, kneeling in front of the, the moment of venture, sort of the Tony Stark idea that like there's a person who discovers something big and they are the big mind, the big man who, who deserves the reward for doing that. And there's some like, you know, faceless assistants in the back, whatever it is, but you know, they're incidental to the plot, right? Um, and then, you know, but on the other hand, if you were to look at sort of the internet age, you know, people, if you look, were to try to do, look at what a graph of innovation looks like, you get something like this. This is a picture of like, you know, the IP address of the internet, right? You just can't put, I mean, you might be able to say, you know, Linus Torvalds did Linux, but the list of contributors that go into it is just enormous that goes into um, the operating system. So the difference between sort of old style and new style uh, innovation is that back in the day, uh, attribution is very important. Uh, we can pull up the patent for the zipper, number 1,219,881, and I can tell you that G. Sunback is the guy who has the patent on the zipper. And this is from like, I don't know, 1917, right? This is amazing. We can attribute this guy to the, to the invention of the zipper. On the other hand, on the right hand side, we have cat memes. Um, and, you know, I've been asked in the past when I give presentations to sign forms that say that I have the right to present everything that I'm presenting. You know, I've asked the license holder and I was like, okay, I want to show some cat memes in my presentation. Who, you know, who took this picture of this, of this cat meme photo? Like, you can't find out who took the photograph. And these are all technically copyright violations. The person who takes the photo has an inherent copyright in that photograph. They, you're not allowed to copy that and, and remix it or do whatever you want, but what really matters is virality, right? You know, that person's not gonna be like, oh, you can't, you can't use my photo for cute cat things, right? You know, because it's mine, I wanna charge you some money for it. But I think they're more excited to see their cat now, you know, trending on Reddit and being like, oh my God, my cat is trending on Reddit. And then, and then that's, you know, that's, that's it for them, right? So virality is sort of like the new currency, not so much attribution. And so um, the concept is that like, you can have different forms of IP protection, right? So these, like whales and bats are both mammals. They're actually both, they both give birth to like young, but all sort of stuff like we are, we're, we're also mammals too. But they're very, they look very, very different. So it's not that you don't have IP protection in China, it's just that they're very different classes of, of organisms. So IP in China, um, the best way I can sort of um, summarize it, it's factory culture meets the internet, right? And so China has sort of like this, this um, 
tendency to sort of promote factory culture. Like they have, the, this is from propaganda posters from the Communist Party celebrating the working man, right? You know, going into the factory and building stuff and, and, and working the factory is glorious, right? Um, and then the thing that happens is that when factories are incredibly cheap and, and the parts for factories are easy to acquire, you end up in a situation where everyone is owning a factory, right? In this, in this picture here, every person here is, is an owner of a factory. Um, this particular facility is that, is that old guy. Um, this, is a, this is a factory where you can go ahead and um, sort of do a heat press uh, lamination of plastic bits together. So if you want to do like a business card holder or something like this, he just bought a bunch of equipment and he has it sitting around it. So basically a garage and this is his factory, right? It's, it's, it's easy to go ahead and start a factory. Um, the result is that you have what I call capability over inventory. So inventory is the picture on the left. If, if you want a USB cable uh, that's 1.8 meters long and you were to go to uh, Challenger or Best Buy or whatever your retail outlet is and you go to the nice guy and you say, hey, I'd like to buy a USB cable that's 1.8 meters long, he'd be like, I'm sorry, we only have 1.5 or 2 meter cables. How about you buy the 2 meter cable and just coil you know, the bit that you don't use? And you're like, no, no, no. I need a 1.8 meter long cable. Please make one for me. The guy looks like you're crazy, right? Like, no, I have these cables. Why don't you be reasonable and buy one? That's inventory. They try to sell you on something that you don't need because they have it in their supply chain, right? Capability, on the other hand, is the ability to produce cables. So in China, there's a guy who has a machine that takes cables and USB ends, and the bottom is the injection molding machine that goes in and puts the head on it. And there's a number he can dial in is 1.8, enter, cut to length, and you come up with a cable that's 1.8 meters long. Right, so this guy, you have a conversation with him, you say, hey, I want a cable that's one point, and you're like, okay, sure, yeah. Okay, how many you want? You want one, you want 10,000? Right, you know, they'll be available tomorrow, right? That's capability, not inventory, right? So when you have a factory culture, you have a lot of capability. When you, don't, when you lose your factories, what you have is a lot of inventory at the end of the day. Um, so you have a huge, massive ecosystem of factories um, inside uh, uh, China. There are factories that feed factories, that go into the gray market, that eventually produce like this, the big factory at the end that you hear like the Foxconn that eventually goes to consumers. And so if you were to go to like a Maker Faire in Shenzhen, it looks more like a trade show and less like a show and tell. As one criticism people had from the West is like, oh, this is just a startup incubator. This is not a Maker Faire. Like, you know, the, this isn't real. These aren't real makers. Like, no, 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 this is making in China. It's like, this is the base level, uh, entry level because everyone has a factory. Um, so the internet in China uh, is different than the internet outside. Um, inside China, content is very openly shared. This is a, a screenshot of um, uh, a website, uh, dyqt8.net, where they're just, you can just download whole Blu-ray videos, right? You know, Finding Nemo, uh, Born Ultimatum 5, wherever it is. You just go click it and download, right? And that's, that's the sharing of content in China. It's a little bit of the Wild West. It's not just movies, the same goes for technology, right? So this is a website called 52rd.com, and this is a, a, a website in which people trade and swap like mobile phone schematics, data sheets, tips and phones, how to build things, uh, post questions, all that sort of stuff. So there's a very sort of open ecosystem where people can go in and very, like, on the surface, they don't have to hide. They're like, you know, hi, I would like to know about everything about the latest Apple CPU. And someone says, oh yeah, I have like leaked docs from the factory. And they're like, okay, cool, I'll trade you my leaked docs from this factory. And then they all just sort of like trade and share. It's a very different ecosystem. Um, so I asked at one point in time, can I download a phone, right? I, I took part, this, this phone you saw from the earlier slide, and it says, I want to find the plans for it. I want to make my own version. Sure enough, you can. So uh, I go and I go onto the website and I'm able to download uh, the data sheets, uh, the schematics, the board layout, and it's an even part of the board layout. This isn't, these aren't Gerbers, these are live editable uh, like PCB in a Lego format, right? So it's not like I was just getting like something I couldn't modify. It's actually like if I want to go ahead and take this thing and add like a bunch of flashing lights on the side, it would be about five minutes of work to go ahead and add the LEDs and I could go fab it out and build it, right? It's, that's, and that's very enabling. That's why you can get like all these little remixes of phones and stuff because like you can get that sort of stuff. Um, and of course, you can see that like, you know, on the data sheet, MediaTek Confidential Reuse for Sin on W, oh, whatever, like, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, there's always inevitably some sort of like watermark on it, but no one, no one pays attention. So the net result of sort of uh, factory culture uh, meeting the internet is that you go from an ecosystem where virality means cat memes, it turns into one where virality means phone memes, 
right? So people, instead of just at the level in the West of being able to mix pictures and put cute text on it, they can be like, I'm going to take motherboards and parts and components and other brands and trademarks and stick them together. I'm going to build a Ferrari phone or I'm going to build like a Hello Kitty, um, literally an Apple phone uh, that's a Hello Kitty in it, with a Hello Kitty on it. Um, and so if you were to unpack uh, that ecosystem, uh, what you have is you have a bunch of small factories who do like industrial design, tooling, plastics, components, uh, circuit boards, firmware. And they, they feed into a system integrator who then um, outputs the, the device at the end. And there's a gray market below sort of like supporting all this by having a buffer of inventory to do it. And the role of sharing in this network is that um, there's a lot of people who could be your component vendor. There's a lot of people who could be tooling. A lot of people who do plastics, right? And so the biggest risk to you is not that you're not attributed for it. The biggest risk is that you're just not discovered and you don't go viral, right? And so the more barriers you put between you and being discovered is the less likely chance that you're going to survive in this ecosystem. So there is an incentive for people to share a portion of their IP. Obviously, they don't put 100% of what they do out there, but there's a large portion of it, enough for you to go ahead and potentially rip, mix, burn, and, uh, and do other things with the, uh, with the IP. Um, another thing that uh, is important in the ecosystem, though, is that embodiment really matters. So there's this phenomenon of the, uh, the hoverboards that you might have been familiar with from a few years back, and those uh, two-wheeled hoverboards. There's a guy who has a patent on the United States. Um, his name is uh, Shane Chen. Uh, and he got it on May 27th, 2014, filed in 2013, right? And people are like, wow, this guy invented it, right? So he should have the right to it, according to uh, um, you know, Western IP theory. However, before this guy even uh, filed the patent, all this stuff in this gray box here in this middle column was happening in China. There are there people with factories who could build electric bikes, who could build single wheel unicycles, who could build battery packs for like, you know, razor scooters, that sort of stuff, right? And so when people saw Justin Bieber go on stage with his hoverboard, right, a bunch of factories are like, oh, super easy. We have the capability to do it. We already have the tooling and ability to create molds for this sort of stuff. We have like the motor capability to do the motors for the wheels, uh, you know, the high torque, low RPM motors. We have the control systems for doing self-balancing unicycles. We have battery systems, all sorts of stuff. In a matter of weeks, they're able to sort of turn these things out in huge mass volume. And so a lot of people go like, okay, who is, the, the, the question in the West is, who is the person who is building these uh, self-balancing scooters? And everyone's like, I don't know. Like, it seems to come from all different factories. Like, they must be really good at, like, obfuscating themselves. Maybe they're using like, a Tor-like network to go ahead and obfuscate the source. Of it. Like, no, it's not actually, it's, a, it's fully distributed manufacturing. You couldn't, you couldn't shut it down because you would hit one, and the, there's still 99 others surviving, right, at the end of the day. And because there was this impression, of, obviously, from the West, is that someone must have invested in the factory. They're like, it's amazing someone built a factory in two weeks that can build these things, as if they went from, like, bare earth, poured concrete, raised the buildings, hired people, put the machines in, and built the factory in two weeks. The only way it happens is these guys already knew how to do it. They are very, very focused on embodying practical inventions and turning them into practice. And when you have that sort of capability, you can go from idea to invention very, very quickly. So the net result is that it's, it's products over patents at the end of the day, right? Like, you know, the, you, you, it will take you three months and $20,000 to like negotiate even a simple license, you know, with lawyers. Or you could just take cash and carry and take the product, right? Who's going who's gonna to get the profit faster? The guy who takes cash and carry over product. And so it's a reinforcement cycle. The guy who goes ahead and manages to sell product before the guy is worried about getting all his trademark filings in order is building a factory. And that guy produces more product even sooner than the guy who's, who's just signing the license deal, goes ahead and makes more money. And then by that point, he's on V2 of the product, already innovating on the next thing, where the first guy is just finally getting his VC money to go ahead and build a factory. So it's a, it, you know, it's a natural reinforcement cycle that happens there that really accelerates and gets people focused on uh, products over patent. And then you end up with a bit of emergent innovation as a result from a very diverse ecosystem. You get stuff like these like wacky little phones. Um, you end up with like Xiaomi. You end up with stuff like Alipay, which you know, in 2014 processed 770 billion uh, in transactions, Apple Pay only did 11 billion, right? And 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 this the Alipay wallet. If you if you see if you read the Chinese there, it says we're an open platform for innovation for payments, you know, in that ecosystem. So they you know they're they're really you know starting to embrace the idea that this openness you know, allows technology 
and virality to, to uh, an adoption at the, at the user level. And so, you know, what you end up with is that, yes, you have IP, like in the West, there's also IP in China. There are different practices of IP. They're both IP protection and, and they both work in their own way. They're just, they grew up in different environments, right? You know, the Western IP uh, environment was pre-internet and China IP is post-internet, if you think about it. So China itself came of age in the 80s. They were building the computers that eventually built the internet that they, that they eventually used to share their IP on. Whereas the Western IP practices were, start, were drafted in Venice in 1700 or something like this, right? And so it's a very ancient system that we still use and we, we think is like the system to use. It hasn't been calibrated at all for the internet today. So if you were to compare sort of like the, you know, the, the, the classic Western um, IP ecosystem, it does encourage high risk basic research, right? So if you need to do for example, a cancer drug or drug discovery. It's 20 years of hard work and then, you know, maybe it comes out at the end of the day. You're going to want the IP protection. It has a place. There's a purpose for that type of IP protection today even. There, there are certain processes where it's very, very reasonable. Um, it can give you predictable defensible earning models, which allows you to collect investors. You can say like, look, I'm going to have a monopoly for 20 years and I'm going to milk it and I'm going to make a bunch of money and you're going to, you're robbing them rich, so give me a bunch of money now, right? That's, that's, that's the VC pitch, right? Um, and it's also a very methodical form of invention. You have named inventors, you have, a, you have a sort of a pedigree, you can sort of point to where things came from at the end of the day. Um, on the other hand, innovation in the internet age, right, is a, it's an agile, robust network, right? So it's not just a single person, it's a network of people. And this network of people can handle systemic complexity very easily, right? So very, very complex things like, you know, even like the hoverboard, can arise overnight because you have a network of people who can collaborate together to create innovation at the end of the day. Um, it does mean there's a constant churn. It's very highly competitive. You're not going to be like, yeah, I'm going to have this factory 20 years from now or I'm going to like retire on this, whatever it is. You've got to love what you do. You've got to keep working at it to, to, to survive in that ecosystem. But a lot of times these people, like, it's not sort of, you know, in, in the Western model, you're like, you know, we're going to go for an IPO and that's like your cash, that's where, where your stock turns into cash. In, on the on the on the sort of more hardware focused internet model, it's the day in which you start selling product the first time. Usually, your product sales are very high at the beginning, and they kind of tail off over end. So you actually, a lot of people who own factories get the cash out a lot faster than people who necessarily are investing their time and effort in building a you know whatever like your latest social media company that needs a, a, a you know a scale of 10 million people to even begin to monetize with ads. Um, and the other thing is that innovation is sort of an emergent network property. So a lot of people are like, you know, what innovation in China? Like, there's, you know, show me the Tony Stark. I mean, there's, there's Jack Ma and those kind of guys. But, like, you know, you don't have, like, Steve Jobs and Reid Hoffman and, like, all these people who, like, are, like, you know, Elon Musk, the named inventors, like, the, the heroes and that sort of stuff. Um, a lot of it in China is very anonymous, right? People just, you know, they're happy to get the virality out there and to make the money. And then, you know, whatever. At that point in time, we've got our money. We're going we're to move on and, and, and do our next thing. Um, so innovation tends to come more as an emergent network property. And the fact that it's emergent from the network doesn't mean it's not there. The fact that I can't point to the person's innovative or I can't point to a single region or whatever it is as the center of innovation, right, and just say this whole area is innovative doesn't mean it's not innovative. It means it's just a different kind of uh, network-based innovation. So the opportunity um, at the end of the day here is, uh, the way I look at it is, is how to actually can we sort of create a hybrid between the two styles of innovation? Like, can, is it possible to, for example, take advantage of this emergent network of innovation, sort of combine it with a bit more of the, the risk-taking and sort of name uh, inventor style and create products that then end up going to consumers? So a lot of the work that I do as a sort of a freelancer and sort of uh, in manufacturing is basically like small design vignettes. Like what is the smallest run I can do and do injection molding and not lose money, right? That's, that's a question that I want to answer. I answer it. What's the smallest run I can do of a laptop and not lose money? What's the, you know, what's the, you know, what is the most crazy custom thing I could get built out of this factory, right? So I do a lot of these like weird sort of almost you know, quixotic sort of projects, but a lot of them are just sort of trying to find different facets of like, what are, what are the parameters we can plug into innovation models and actually utilize and then turn into uh, sort of an impedance matched form of innovation that you can uh, market and sell 
uh, into the Western ecosystem. And so that's my talk. Thanks. Great. <clears throat> Very insightful, Danny. Um, a lot of photos, too. Any questions from the audience about machines and supply chain? Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, it's usually it's very interesting. I've got a question. This uh, things that you described would it work only for consumer-facing products, or that style of innovation applicable for for you know, any aspect of I know, software development or biology or you know, all yeah, other I things? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, right. Can can this network style emergent innovation uh, help? Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think the network style uh, emergent innovation is exactly what open source is in software today. We have that already, and people are willing to accept that because there's no cost of goods in this solid attribution. Um, it, it, I think, in, for example, in areas like biology, it, it can help. Like, there is some examples of it helping, but it can also can, be, it can hurt because biology is actually a really difficult field. Um, reproducibility is, like, the number one enemy. You, like you, you do an experiment, you get a good result, the next day you don't get the same result, right? And so if you have a supply chain with like fake reagents and bits and pieces going through it, you're just tearing your hair out trying to do basic experiments. So there, 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 there's, a, there's a fine line be in there, but, um, but one of the things is you can get reagents much cheaper in China, right? And so it is, there's a bit, there's a balance between like how much do you go towards like a populist model of, of innovation versus sort of like an institutional model of innovation versus the difficulty of the research that you're trying to approach. Yeah. Any other? So yeah, so most of the stuff you see is <clears throat> people taking components and doing new things with components. They're all already like baked goods, the fundamental components. I've the been, silicon, yeah. Yeah, I've been, I've been recently, the uh, last couple of years, involved with the RISC-V mm -hmm. uh, project uh, mm -hmm. and, and Using, they're using like chisel as a, as a means of creating CPUs and I have an idea for like a stack processor I want. At what point in time uh, or do you think they're going to be to the point where I could take a design that I did as FPGA and, and get an ASIC that's actually going to run competitive to something yeah. that I would go to another chip fab for? Yeah. I think we're, we're, we're basically at that point. We're at that inflection. Um, there's an inflection point we're hitting very soon. It's a combination of factors. Moore's Law slowed down. Right, so uh, even like the top end chips are still taping out 14 nanometers today. It's and we would expect it to be like nine by this point or wherever it is if it was keeping up. Um, and so uh, the slowdown Moore's law means that a lot of the fab capacity that is accessible to mere mortals and smaller companies um, is now coming down in price on the same curve that Moore's law predicted. But now you're basically running the same fab that like you know Intel or IBM might be running a Power Nine or an X86. Um, in, the, in level, probably not 14, but maybe 28 nanometers, still good enough, right? Um, and so, uh, so there's, that's one thing. The other thing is, is yes, that sort of fab capacity is coming online and addressing those markets. You are starting to see more and more. Um, there are a lot of like Chinese companies that do ASICs, like Huawei and Rock Chips, and you know all those those guys who are uh, churning these things out, either based on ARM or RISC or Chisel or RISC V, whatever it is, right? Um, and I think it's more, you know. Um, just that ecosystem trying to organize itself, trying to figure out, like, once, once, they, once a business model is found that produces money, people are going to jump all over it. It's going to really, um, uh, I think, really explode. So I think, I think you will sort of see that level of innovation taking off. And there's also another whole section of innovation in the ASIC space, which is not around SOCs and the high-end stuff, but there's actually a, a huge untapped market at the bottom. Like, so sort of like, you know, 250 nanometer, 180 nanometer, like oldish silicon, but the, the, the win there is condensing a whole bunch of analog and discrete IP into single chips and really making things tiny, tiny, tiny. So like, you know, complete in-ear sort of earphones that have a lot more processing, um, you know, pills that you can swallow that do tracking of your intestines and that sort of stuff and um, telemetry of packages, you know, through RFIDs, that sort of things. These all require that, that level of silicon integration that was very inaccessible before. I think you'll sort of see a sort of a, a sort of a second boom of like, sort of like the echo, echo wave. Like so, the, the leading wave was sort of the high-end processors, and then there'll be like another wave behind it of sort of like people sort of like, okay, well, you know, we have smaller, more niche products that are interesting to do, and they're sort of riding this other wave behind. 
any other interesting questions to this topic? I mean, Benny, maybe if I can just ask um, something you just mentioned in your answer now is that a lot of this is commercially driven. Mm. And so perhaps one of the points to raise is in the West, a lot of the innovation is altruistic, you know, some sort of new creative designs. And maybe what's your th thought to that in this Shenzhen model? Yeah, I mean... There, there are people who, who are kind of sort of otaku-ish. They just build stuff and they innovate and they don't really care. They just sort of keep turning stuff out. But like, um, you know, in every sort of organization, there's like, I, I had a boss who once said like, um, in, every, in every company of like, you know, there's a division of 200 people. There's that one guy in the back room who like no one knows and he never talks to anybody, but he like produces like 90% of the, of the actual like innovation in that company, right? Um, and so uh, I think the ecosystem does have pockets of those guys and they don't even care to be like they're so far from the attribution layer They're so fundamental to, to, to a bunch of stuff um, so that that does happen But I think that's just a there's just certain human beings who are like that who, who really get into something and They lock in and they and I think that's the nice invariant is that happens regardless of the ecosystem You see them in Japan you see them in China you see them in Europe and the United States they, I've seen them everywhere um, but overall um, I do think that particularly when you talk about hardware, there is fundamentally a commercial bent to it, right? There's, you, in order to build the hardware, you have to spend s some money for the atoms. No one will give you a pile of atoms for free. They don't even give you water for free, right? You know? um, so at the end of the day, uh, fundamentally, uh, hardware innovation is tied to a commercial aspect, which is like, it, it, and that's one of the big differences between like when you talk about open source software, open source hardware, a lot of people in open source software don't wrap their heads around the fact that like money and liability are actual things you have to deal with in hardware. No, good. I mean, just a round of applause again for that. Money.